just to share with you one thought. When we just read the story of Noah and the flood, great story, mankind is decrepit, morally corrupt, and God says, no, we have to start again, and we're going to build this ark. And when God tells him to build the ark, he gives very specific dimensions as to the length, as to the width, as to the height. But when it comes to interior design, as all men should do, Noah was meant to leave it up to his wife to decide how this was going to be designed. As a matter of fact, when we uh, moved from New York to Michigan, I had never even seen our home before we bought it. My wife came, and she checked it out. I said, honey, do I have a desk and do I have a bed? She said, yes. I said, we could buy the house. It's fine. And my contribution to the interior design of our home was to stay out of her way as much as possible. Be very supportive. I say, I understand these are big decisions, and I support whatever you do, but never to interfere. So Noah's wife was in charge of interior design. But there was one specific command that God gives to Noah. He says, Noah, I need you to put a window in the ark. Build a window. The, the, the verse in Hebrew is, so hard ta'asilateva, you shall make a window. And the question is, if Noah and his wife would prefer a candle-lit dinner, why was it so critical that they have a window? Why was this so important that God says, build a, a window into the ark? And I saw once a beautiful idea that Noah was in that ark for how many days? 365 days, cooped up in this ark, the smell must have been horrific with the animals. You know, I also just heard that humans are the only people that their own smell, the smell of their body, bothers them. You never found an animal saying, oh, it smells like elephants around here. I can't take it in this elephant enclosure. Let me go somewhere else. It doesn't bother them. To humans, it does. And that's to give us the gift of realizing that we're imperfect, to help us improve ourselves. So Noah was in this ark with the animals and must have smelled pretty bad for 365 days, feeding them, cleaning up after them, never able to go outside. I'm a runner, and when I, when I can't leave the house for two days to go for a run, I feel like, you know, the dog that needs to get off for a walk, right? I, I gotta, gotta get out. Cooped up for a year. And you could start to say, this is miserable, this is horrible. And therefore he needs a window, because when he looks out that window and he sees what's going on on the outside, outside of that ark, complete and utter devastation decimation, people just being washed away. And that window is a perspective into his own life. I had it pretty good. Let me count my blessings. So having a baby, that was my thought that I'm sharing with you on my Mazel Tov thought, which is that it's not easy having a newborn baby, right? Now, I, I don't tell my wife that I complained about this because she tell, tells me I'm not allowed to be sleep deprived because she sleeps even less. So I'm not, I'm, I'm doing great, you know, you know but you get woken up in the middle of the night, and it's not trying to leave the house with a newborn. You know, it's just when you're ready to go, she either spits up or it makes a diaper, and then you're automatically late. But when you take a step back and you realize what a blessing it is to have a healthy baby with ten perfect fingers and ten tiny little toes, everything perfect, it's an incredible blessing. That's the window, that's the perspective. Okay, so the topic of today's class, this past summer in July, from July 2nd until the 9th, I went on a trip. I led a trip to Poland and to Budapest, and I had never been there before in my life. I had never gone to these places, and we took 28 couples, 56 people. We took to see the history, to see what had transpired during the Second World War, and um, I had some thoughts and some insights, some reflections that I wanted to share with you this morning. So before I had ever gone to Poland, I heard from my father his experience in going to Poland. He went to Poland, he went to the Ukraine, to Babiar. There was a dedication of a, of a cemetery that he went for. And when he visited Auschwitz, there was a tour guide who was Polish, who was anti-Semitic. An anti-Semitic tour guide in Auschwitz Thank God they don't employ those people anymore, but they did, going back 20 years ago. Really? Yeah, shocking, right? <laughs> and as they're going through the tour, the tour guide spoke about the political dissidents, the gypsies, the homosexuals, the blacks, that were killed in mass in Auschwitz. And my father pipes up. My father is quite feisty, and he's, he's not at all timid. And he says, well, what about the Jews? And the tour guide said, no. Be a handful, but definitely not, you know, not what the world claims. And then there's a wall, and on the wall they have names, people that had, I don't like the word perished, because perished implies that it happened on their own, that were murdered. 
in Auschwitz. And the tour guide is specifically choosing the non-Jewish names. And my father again pipes up and says, look, it says Goldman. It says Silverberg. And the tour guide says, sir, you're being extremely rude. Would you please quiet down? And as the tour is going, and as this tour guide is kind of denying the fact that Jews were killed in mass in Auschwitz, my father could not quiet down. He was incapable of remaining silent in the face of this, this, this dishonesty. And he keeps interrupting, and finally he is thrown out of the tour, and the tour guide says, Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to wait for us by the crematorium, which was the end of the tour. And um, I, I joke that my father was the only Jew thrown out of Auschwitz alive, but he was thrown out of this tour. And he never wanted to go back. He probably never will go back. And this was, this was my introduction, hearing about this as a child, about going to Poland. I never wanted to go. I never wanted to go. I didn't want to support their economy with my dollars. I didn't want to walk on the soil that was drenched in Jewish blood. Something changed. And I, I realized that I've read extensively on the Holocaust. I've watched many documentaries and films. And I decided that seeing it in person, going and seeing it, witnessing it firsthand, is different, more impactful and powerful than just reading about it in the books. And I wanted to go. And I led this trip together with my wonderful wife. She's certainly my better half. And um, together with uh, a very talented team, Rabbi Levy Burnham was on this trip, we began the trip. And we landed in Warsaw. We landed on a Monday morning in Warsaw. And the first place that we went to was a place called the Umschlagplatz. Now what that is, was that was the train station, the place of deportation where they, in cattle cars, loaded, packed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews and transported them to places where they would be concentrated and killed. And there's a big wall with names names of Jews who had been deported from this Umschlagplatz. And we had an incredibly talented tour guide named Ellie. Ellie was our tour guide. He had a British accent, which is just this unfair advantage. Everything he said sounded so intelligent. As they would say, he sounded smart, right? Or you dress smart, but it was, it was just... And he says to everyone in our group, does everyone here have a Hebrew name? And everyone had a Hebrew name. He said, I want you to find your name on this wall. And each person is looking, looking at the wall trying to find their name. Just about every single one of us was able to find our Hebrew name on that wall. And what that did was the power of that, feeling of connection. These people have the same names that we do. This is, this, these are our ancestors. These are our people. This is our family. It gave us a connection. But it also, it also gave us this sense of the richness of our heritage, that we continued to bear those names of these people. And there's something very significant about a name. Our sages tell us that when the Jews were in Egypt, they did not go by the, you know, the, the, the current Egyptian names. They maintained whatever Jewish names they had. And in that merit, in the merit of the fact that they kept their Jewish names, they were redeemed from Egypt and they were taken out of bondage, liberated and brought into the Promised Land. My name is Chaim. There are some people, many people, that have two names, which is great. You have a name which is easy to pronounce. Chaim is not one of those easy to pronounce names. You know? So sometimes I'll tell people that my name is Chaim. C-H-A-I-M. Chaim, that's the way you would spell it. My mother, on her iPhone, she wants to say, call Chaim, and Suri never gets it. So I said, Mom, save me as James, because Chaim and James. Now she says to her iPhone, call James, and it calls Chaim. So I was in New York. I grew up in New York. And I was in a clothing store, Brooks Brothers clothing store in New York, and there was a very nice black gentleman behind the counter. And he says to me, what's your name? And I said, my name is Chain. And he says, that's really Chaim, isn't it? <laughs> so he, he knew that. You know, so there's just there's something very significant about our Jewish names. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing to have. And there are people who have both, because in, the, in, in, in their workplace, They'll go by Steve, because Steve is easy to say. But they'll also have a Hebrew name and by which they are called to the Torah. That is what is written on the ketuvah, on the marriage contract, the Hebrew name. Fascinating halakhic question I once got about a Hebrew name. There was a woman 
Her whole life, she went by one name. I don't remember the exact name, so I'm going to make it. She went by the name Rivka or Rebecca. That was her name. That's what everyone called her her whole life. She found out when she was married for 36 years that her parents had named her when she was born Rachel. Her parents named her Rachel, but somehow the name Rebecca, Rivka, stuck on her marriage contract. <laughs> It's vital that you get the name right. The, the document is invalid if the name is incorrect. And if you have an invalid marriage contract, then husband and wife are not allowed to be together. On the marriage contract, it said, Rebecca, what everyone had called her her whole life. She finds out that her birth name was Rachel. She comes to me with this question, is her marriage contract valid or not? Good question, right? And this, this, the ramifications are very significant. She can't be with her husband if she doesn't have a marriage contract. The Ketubah. I did not know the answer, but my wife's grandfather is one of the greatest rabbinic authorities on names, on Jewish names, and I called him up, and he very decisively, very clearly answered that if the whole world calls you a name for 36 years, then that is your name, and what happened at your birth is irrelevant, the marriage contract was valid, you did not have to redo it. Okay. Amen. Yeah, it's a good one. I just want to take a minute to thank Bela Berman for setting up this incredible breakfast. Bela, thank you. It's very nice and beautiful, so thank you, Bela. All right, I'm going to kind of go through the trip with you and share some insights as we move along. So the next stop that we, that we went to was a bunker, and this was the, the, the last holdout in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So keep on, this is, this is fascinating. The Warsaw Ghetto, between April and May, of 1943, the German SS commander Jürgen Strupp was given the task of liquidating the ghetto, and in that ghetto there were a group of fighters, very poorly armed, and they were able to withstand the German forces for almost an entire month. Almost an entire month they were able to battle the German forces. How long did the Polish army, the great Polish army, how long did they withstand the German blitzkrieg? Less than two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks the great Polish army fell and crumbled. The poorly trained Jewish fighters lasted almost an entire month. And we went to this bunker, which was the last hole, it's called Mila 18. It's on a street called Mila Street. There we told the story of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. And then our blessed tour guide, Eli, shared with us the following. This was so powerful. He said, you know, that uprising happened between April and May. What great Jewish holiday is right around that time of the year? Passover, Pesach. And he told the story of a boy named Moshe, Moshe, as his parents so endearingly called him. And he was there Passover night asking his father the four questions. And he asked the four questions. Why is it that all the nights of the year we have both the chametz, both the leaven bread and the matzah, time is only matzah? He asks the questions in perfect form. Then he says, Daddy, this year I have a fifth question for you. Will I be alive next year to ask you the four questions again? Will I be here? Everyone knew their situation was so precarious. Alive today, perhaps dead tomorrow. Will I be alive next year? And that was his fifth question. And his father looks at little Marshall and he says, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe yes, maybe not. Likely not. But I guarantee you one thing, Marshall. Somewhere in this world, there will be a Moshe who will ask his father the four questions. We as a people are eternal. We will endure, we will persevere, we will continue to exist. That's an incredible thing, the miracle. The miracle of the eternity of the Jewish people. You know, there is no people, no nation more persecuted than us. Going back to the pogroms, to the Inquisitions, <coughs> to the Cossacks. The Crusaders, the Holocaust, they will try to wipe us off. King David says in Psalms, he says the following line, he says, Lo amus, I will not die, ki ech yet, but I will live. And I was always troubled when I read that line, what does King David mean? He's going to live, he's not going to die. King David died at the age of 70. King David died at the age of 70. Fascinating <coughs> story. The Midrash tells us that when Adam was created by God, the first man, Adam HaRishon, was created by God, he was supposed to live for a full 1,000 years. How long did he actually live? 
He lived till 930, 70 years less than his prescribed time. And the story goes according to the Midrash that God shows Adam, all the souls, people that are going to be born, and Adam sees this one soul where this is this incredible light, very strong light, but it, it, it just it flickers and goes out, keeps flickering and going out, and, and Adam says to God, what's that soul? And he says, wow, that's a soul with tremendous potential, that's a soul that could be David. But it's going to live for just a moment, and then it's going to die. And Adam said, I want to give 70 years of my life to that soul. And hence David lived 70 years and Adam lived 930. So King David says in Psalms, I will not die for I will live and I will speak of the praise of God. And the question is, what does that mean? I will live, I will not die. He's mortal. He died. And the commentators explain he's not referring to himself as a person. He's referring to the nation as a whole. The Jewish people are guaranteed immortality. We will continue to endure. There always will be a Moshe somewhere in the world who will ask his father the four questions. We're still in Warsaw. It's a packed day. Mark, who's been with us on trips, knows that we, we hit the ground running. Right? We try to just take in as much as possible. There is an incredible monument in Warsaw called the Rappaport Memorial. The Rappaport Memorial, you see it right outside the Pollen Museum. Big black monument. Now, what's fascinating about this monument was that this stone, this large stone, I, I, don't, I don't know how much it weighs, was acquired. Hitler, may his name be erased and blotted out forever, Hitler bought this stone during the war when he thought he was going to conquer the world. And from that stone, he was going to create a statue of himself, a world dominator, leader of the world. And that's why he purchased it. He didn't win the war. And the stone was later acquired by this museum after the war, and they made a Jewish memorial out of it. And what's fascinating about this big stone, this memorial, it has two sides. On one side, you see Jews from the ghetto being led to their deaths, and they're, they're being led with their heads bowed, broken in spirit, submiss submissive to their fate. And on the other side of the memorial, you see fighters from the Warsaw ghetto who are unusually thin because they didn't have what to eat. They're strong. And I believe that perhaps the intent of the sculptor on this memorial was that on one side you have the heroes, and on the other side, you have the cowards, people who could not fight back. Perhaps that was the intent. That's what I saw when I looked at this. That was, that's what I believe was trying to be portrayed. And that notion bothers me somewhat. And let me explain to you why. Because if you look very carefully at the side of the elderly and the infants and the children who are being marched to their deaths, you'll notice something fascinating. There is a Jewish bubby, a grandmother, holding on to an infant, clutching an infant. This woman is too old to have an infant of her own. What's the story behind this grandmother, this bubby with the infant? And the story is that when the cattle cars opened, and the Germans were shouting, and the dogs were barking, and they tried to make this as chaotic as possible, they designed the chaos so there should be no resistance. There was a Jewish bubby who, in the face of all this insanity, had the clarity of mind to realize that if her own daughter is to continue clutching her infant, the Nazis would send the mother and the infant to the left and gas them both. This bubby knew that they were killing the elderly and the children. So she says, let me save my daughter's life. She says to her daughter, give me the baby right now. And she's holding on to the baby so that her daughter could go to the right side. Otherwise, all three would die. And I ask you, is that not heroism? That clarity, that strength of spirit, which was indomitable, you could not conquer that Jewish body. Maybe you could kill her. You can't beat her. Isn't that heroism? Doesn't that mean to be a hero? If there was a Jew who saw someone less fortunate than themselves and shared perhaps their, some of their bread, with somebody who was in a worse situation than them. Is that not a hero? My wife's grandfather was a survivor of many concentration camps, Auschwitz included. 
I watched the interview when Steven Spielberg had someone interview him. He couldn't really talk about his experiences there. Someone said to him, well, how was Auschwitz? And he says, it was not a four-star hotel. That was the most he could say. He couldn't really talk about it. At his funeral, I heard a story. And the story went that in Auschwitz, he was fortunate to work in the kitchen. Because if you worked in the kitchen, you had access to some scraps, to some peels, potatoes. Every day when he was leaving the kitchen, he would line his pockets. He would fill them up with vegetable peels that were peeling, and carrots and potatoes. He would fill them up to share with his bunkmates, because they were starving. Potato peels were a commodity. Give them to the pigs, but not to the Jews. And he would share them. And one day, the SS caught him with his pockets full, and they beat him. And the miracle was that despite the fact that they beat him to the point where he was unconscious and bloody on the ground, he was given the chance to recuperate and recover. And he was, perhaps a week or two later, back on the job. And his first day back on the job, he once again filled his pockets with vegetable peels for his starving bunkmates. That's a hero. It's not true that the only heroes are ones that fall back with weapons. Now, let's ask the question. Well, if they're going to kill you anyway, so why not fight back? Uh, that's, that's, I'm going to ask that question. Well, perhaps the Germans were masters at deception. They didn't tell you we're going to kill you. They said, we're going to load you on these trains for relocation. We're going to, you know, they had them pack their suitcases, right? A, so they could steal whatever belongings they had. The sorting centers that they had at these camps were vast, incredible. You see mountains of eyeglasses, toothbrushes, shoe polish brushes. Sorted everything. So, A, they brought the suitcases in order to be able to steal everything the Jews had and organize it well. But B, if they told me to take my suitcase, then it must be true, being relocated. And by the time you went through the starvation of the ghetto, the disease and starvation of the ghetto, and then you were without food and water in the cattle car for three, five, a week, three, five days, a week, by the time you got out on that platform and they were yelling at you, dogs barking, there was nothing left. It, 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 was, it, was, it was impossible. Impossible. They also, you know, the collective responsibility. If you, if you fight back, we'll kill your family. We'll kill. It, 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 there, there was not much of an opportunity for that. We were fortunate on this trip to meet the chief rabbi of Poland. He stationed in Warsaw. We went to his synagogue where he is the rabbi of, and then he met our group over dinner. And he told about the Jews in Poland and trying to rebuild the community. And just to show you how beautiful Jews are, what a great people. He says to me, Chaim, you know, very often when a, a chief rabbi comes and gives a speech, there's a certain honorarium that's customary to give to the speaker. Please don't give me anything. But this is what I could use from you. There are Jews in Poland who need mezuzahs. They need the mezuzahs to hang on their doorposts. We are here, have a shortage of them. Can you please bring along some mezuzahs that I could distribute? What a beautiful thing. Cares about his community. Don't give me anything. Bring something for the Jews of Poland. And it was a beautiful ceremony. We presented him on, be on behalf, him accepting these mezuzahs on behalf of the Polish Jewish community. We gave him the mezuzahs. So that was our first day's all. It was a, it was a busy day. <laughs> um, and then we traveled to a city called Lublin, moving south in Poland a little bit. Our first stop in Lublin was a building that was known as the Yeshiva of Chachme Lublin, founded by a man named Rabbi Meir Shapiro. This man was a visionary. He founded a first yeshiva of its kind when there was a dormitory and a dining room and students would be able to study Talmud in this incredible facility. But he also founded something else which lives on to this day, and that's called Daf Yomi. There are Jews who study one page of Talmud every single day, and Jews around the world are all studying the same page of Talmud. So Jews in Australia, in Israel, Great Britain, South Africa, New York, California are all studying the same page of Talmud, and he was the founder of this, of this movement. And what we did, we thought it was most appropriate, when we, our group visited this yeshiva, what did we do? We studied the page of Talmud of that day, in the yeshiva where he founded this 
this, this, this movement. It was, it was incredible. Next up was a concentration camp, a death camp, called Maidanik. And a few things of note. First of all, the reason why, there, there are many, there are many concentration camps. I didn't want to go to too many because it would be too much of a downer. I didn't want to go to so many. We only went to two, Maidanik and to Auschwitz. But what was significant about Maidanik is that it is the most intact death camp that exists because the Germans tried very hard to destroy the evidence before they retreated from the Russian army. They didn't have a chance to destroy anything in Maidanik. And it looks exactly the way it did when it was working under the SS. Exactly. The crematoria, the ovens, the gas chambers. The other significant thing about this camp was that people's homes, residential homes, residents of the city of Lublin lived right next to the camp. You could walk from your front door of where you live and be at the front gate of the camp in about three minutes walking. I could sprint it in probably under, under a minute. And they claimed they didn't know what happened. It's hard to believe. It is so hard to believe. It's not true. It's not true. They knew exactly, they knew. What, exactly what happened. They knew and they supported and they were happy. We're pulling into this camp. Our tour bus is pulling in, all 56 of us, pulling into this camp. And there is a bus of Polish teenagers on their way out. They had just toured the barracks. They had seen the hundreds of thousands of pairs of shoes of the murdered victims. They had walked into the gas chambers and seen the fingernail scratches on the walls of it. Seen the ovens with the chimneys. And now they see a bus of Jews coming in to tour the site. I tell you, friends, anti-Semitism is still alive and well in Poland. Because you know what they were gesturing to us as we were coming in? Hateful, anti-Semitic gestures, slogans, words. Hitler should have killed you all. Drop dead Jews, giving us their finger. That was what we encountered on the way into Maidanik. Now, after the trip, we asked people, please tell me what was your highlight? What did you feel was most significant about this trip. And we covered a lot. And there was a person who, after I gave it a thought, I thought, this was, I thought it was very appropriate, who said to him the most significant thing on this trip was encountering this rabid anti-Semitism. As they had just witnessed what happened to our people, this is their reaction. Seeing that to him was so impactful, to see that the hatred that caused it is still there. It's still there. I, I went running. I got it. I like to run. And in order for me to have the focus to run this trip, I needed to go running in the mornings. I had to go early because we, read a, we, we had a minion. Anyone who wanted could come and pray with us in the morning. We had a minion every single morning with over 20 people each time. So I had to go running before the minion. Early morning runs. I went running on the streets of Lublin, on the streets of Krakow. And I didn't wear my kippah. I was worried to do that. I wore my baseball cap, hmm. jacket. And somehow they could smell you. I don't know how they know. But I sensed that they knew that I was Jewish from the looks that they were giving me. Oh. And I was afraid. My only consolation was that I might be able to outrun most of these people. But every time I passed somebody, I had my eyes very carefully looking at their hands, making sure no one tried to pull anything out of their pocket. That was my... I was scared running on these streets of Poland. The anti-Semitism was so alive and well over there. So just to share with you two things that happened at this, at this place. We went into one of these very large gas chambers. We stood, 50 people, we lined the perimeter of the room, kind of locked arm in arm, and we said, what were the last words of the victims in this room? What was the last thing they said? What does a Jewish person say the moment before they die? Shema Yisrael Adonai 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 And we decided it would be appropriate to chant that. We started to chant again and again repetitively. And then we began to sing it. And it was just, it was so powerful because we said to ourselves that these victims can't go home ever again to their children and say Shema with their children before they put them to bed at night. But we could. 
we have the ability to take that message of Shema, the mantra of our people, our faith, and go home and tell that to our children. It was, they say that Eichmann, Eichmann was captured by the Mossad in the 1960s. He was in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And he went under, he didn't go by the name Adolf Eichmann. He didn't think that would be good for his cover. Um, Roberto Clemente, I believe, was his name. He lived on a street called Gabriel. The street, Isser Haral, who was the head of the Mossad, was instrumental in the capture of Adolf Eichmann. And they, you know, they knew they knew his route very well. They drove a car along where he was walking. They put they pulled him into the back seat and they brought him to whatever safe house they had. And they interrogated him. And they said that there were chills running down their spines when he said to them, "Shema Yisrael." He knew it by heart. He knew that line by heart. Because that's what Jews say before they die. He killed many Jews. He heard it many, many times. The way they got him back to Israel, fascinating story. They didn't have permission to be operating on foreign soil. This was a clandestine operation. So what they did was they dressed him up like an El Al store. They created a fake passport for him. They put him in a uniform of a steward from El Al, and they drugged him up. He was barely able to talk, and they had one Mossad agent on one side dressed up like a steward of El Al, one Mossad agent on the other side, each one supporting him. When they get to the passport control, they said he had way too much to drink last night. Here's his passport, and they got him on the plane. He was put on trial, and he was hung. That's the story of Adolf Eichmann, but he knew the Shema that hurt. The end of the tour of Maidanic. There were 70 tons of human ash, Jews that they had cremated. They, thought they wanted to rob the Jews of everything, they wanted to make sure they took everything from us. And ash can be used as fertilizer. And there were farmers. Let me tell you, friends, Poland is still a beautiful and fertile land, very well fertilized with the blood and ash of Jews who were murdered. And um, they would sell the ash to farmers living right, yeah, right there, right there. I ran past farms within walking distance of the, of the area. And uh, 70 tons of human ash. We came, we said the prayer service, the memorial, the Kamwale. And it was there that Rabbi Levi Burnham, who was there with us, said, you know, what's the message? What do we say? So, you know, we try to say, never again. We are going to make sure this never happens again. We're going to do everything in our power. We're going to have a Simon Wiesenthal Center. We're going to spread awareness. We're going to make sure this never happens again. Do we really have that power to ensure that it never happens again? Right now, as we sit here enjoying the breakfast, there are scientists who used to work in Iran. But then we made the Iran deal, and they are somewhat limited. So now where are those Iranian scientists developing nuclear weapons? They're in North Korea. They are in North Korea working for them because North Korea has no agreement. There are no restrictions in North Korea. And they are working very quickly to develop nukes. Probably Iran and North Korea will share those. Iran has made it very clear. They don't hide the fact that they've said that their goal is to wipe the, what they call the Zionist regime off the face of the planet. So do we have the power to ensure a never again? Frightfully, no. But... Here's the thing, when there is unity and harmony, when there is brotherly and sisterly love among the Jewish people, we are impervious to the attack of our enemies. They can't touch us, they can't harm us. And said Rabbi Levi Burnham, if we're looking to ensure that this never happens again, what we need to do is bond together as a community. As a matter of fact, when I was, when I was recruiting for this trip, I said to people, this is a trip about building bridges. We, we had Jews who were of Orthodox persuasion, Jews who are members of conservative synagogues, Jews who pray at Reform temples, and we all came on this trip together. Good. It was beautiful. I said, you know, Hitler, before I put you on the train and say, excuse me, what synagogue do you pray in? Are you Reform or are you Orthodox? He didn't care. He didn't differentiate or distinguish between different kinds of Jews, and neither should we. This is a trip where we're going to build the unity of the Jewish people. And that's the way that we can ensure never again.
Did you build that unity we on did. the trip? We did. We succeeded in that. There are people who have formed friendships and relationships okay. that still last months later. Thank God we were successful in that. I'll share with you a Torah thought going back to the Torah portion of Noah. There are two incidents that happen in that, in, that, in that Torah portion. Number one is the flood. And what was the prelude? What was the reason why God said we have to bring the flood? You know why? Because people were stealing from each other. They were pillaging and pilfering in small quantities so you couldn't even go to court to get it back. There's an episode at the end of the Torah portion, the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. What happened there? Jews, not Jews, the people that lived in that area were building a tower that somehow wanted to wage war against God. Not exactly sure how they were going to accomplish that. They wanted to wage a war against God. Which seems like a more serious crime. Wage war against God. Well, that's, that's pretty severe. What happened to them? They were dispersed. God said, I'm going to disperse them. I am going to program their minds with different languages. Fascinating, you know? One thing that you see when you travel through Europe is you travel... 20 miles, 30 miles, and you cross a border. And all of a sudden, you need, you need new currency. Whatever coins you have in your pocket are no longer valid. And they speak a different language. You go from the Czech Republic to Slovakia, and you end up in Hungary. Every couple of miles is a new language. And this to me was always a fascinating question, which is that if we believe, and I do believe, in the notion that God created one man, Adam, and the world was populated through that one man and his family, and he spoke probably one language. Right? When, when Adam was created, this is just an interesting thought, babies are born and they slowly learn how to speak, right? In my case, the first word my daughter will say is Abba, and then she's <laughs> going to say Ima. That's the way it usually goes in our family. Much to my wife's consternation. That's the way it goes. I think it's an easier sound, ba 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 they naturally say. But anyway, when a baby is born, they learn very slowly how to speak. When Adam was created, he was programmed by God. Right? It's like when you buy a computer, it comes with a certain software on it. Right? One of those things, you know, Microsoft Word and Excel. Adam came pre-programmed with the ability to speak. That intelligence. At the Tower of Babel, when they were waging war against God, God reprogrammed their minds with different languages. Because otherwise, how do you explain if we're all descendants of one person and we all spoke one language? So I understand that over the years, words, words could develop and they could kind of you know, just, uh, they, they could evolve. But there should be no commonality between the Mandarin language of the Chinese and the English language of the Americans. How do we explain that? How could there be no commonality, no similarities at all, if they both originated from the same dialect? And here's the answer in the Tower of Babel, that God just kind of reprogrammed mankind to disperse them, created 70 different languages. Okay, but going back to the question, which crime was more severe? That of the tower of the waging war against God. Or a little infighting. They're going to steal from me, I'll steal from you. We're not going to respect each other's property. I'll back up into your car, and then say, I hope they don't notice the dent. Let me drive away quickly, right? That, that's what was going on. Not literally with the automobiles, but you, you know what I'm talking about. And the answer is, perhaps it's worse to wage war against God. But they were united. And when there is unity among mankind, God is more forgiving. And particularly when there's unity amongst the Jewish people. That is our greatest protection. And that was the message that we heard when we stood by this pile of ash. And if we want to ensure and never again, we must work more on our unity, on our love. Focus on what we have in common and appreciate our differences. Next, we ended up in Krakow. And there's this museum, synagogue, filled with Judaica. They have a little ply saying, this is a Sidur, which is a Jewish prayer book. This is an Etro box, where Jews on the holiday called Sukkot take this citrus fruit, and this is a box they would use. All kinds of stuff that are just so commonly found in Jewish homes were on display. This is a crown. They would use a silver crown to, to adorn the Torah scroll. Literally a, a room filled with your day. I, mean, I had this feeling almost like I was on display. It was a strange feeling. I felt like I was on an exhibit. You know, these, these are things that are just so, so natural and common to me. Every day I pick up the Sidor. 
and this is on display over here. So it was a bit awkward feeling like, I, you know, it's, no one wants to feel like you're a monkey in an enclosure on show. And I kind of felt that not me personally, but my life, things that are so, so just, you know, so attached to my daily living were on display. That was a strange feeling. But it also gave me the sense of connection. My Etro box looks pretty identical to that one that was used hundreds of years ago. So there was this sense of, you know, even though it felt uncomfortable being on display, it felt good to know that we are connected to the richness of our past. Next, incredible story. Going back to the 15-1600s, there was a rabbi named the Ramo. That's an acronym for his name, Rabbi Moshe Israelis. And this man had a synagogue, and we stopped in his synagogue, and we stopped at his burial place. But what he spent years, probably decades of his life, was he felt it important to write a code of Jewish law. Meaning, shockingly, when it comes to Jewish law, it's no different than other areas of Jewish life. Not everyone agrees. Right? That's their disagreements, and that's perfectly fine. That's not, that's not a lack of harmony. That's, that's an intellectual debate, which is great. We love debating differences of opinion, as long as you respect the other side, it's great. But it wasn't clear what to do. If you have two opinions, well, what do you do? And this man of emotion, Israel, he's dedicated his life to writing this code of Jewish law that will be followed by Jews all over. There was another rabbi who happened to have been working on the same thing, and they were not in contact with each other. Rabbi Moshe Israelis did not know that Rabbi Joseph Cairo also was working on the same thing. And Rabbi Joseph Cairo, known as the Beit Yosef, he published his Shulchan Aruch, his code of Jewish law first. You can imagine what that felt like when Moshe Israel was dedicated years of his life, and now someone else publishes it first. They didn't know about each other. And he could have said, okay, well, I'm going to publish my book also. I worked so hard on it. But he didn't. He said, I want there to be one uniform code of Jewish law. And Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Cairo lived in the lands of Egypt, in the lands of Israel, in the Sephardic lands. Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Israelis lived in Poland, where the Ashkenazi Jews lived. And what he did was he took the text of the Shulchan Aruch that, he, that was published before him, and he said, I am going to just make little amendments in areas that I don't agree fully. I'm going to make a little note saying, Ashkenazi Jews do this a little bit differently. Because he wanted there to be one code of Jewish law. Jewish law. And you think about the self-sacrifice in that, you know? To say, I want there to be unity. I want us to all have the same book. And therefore, I'm willing to kind of bury the years of my life that I spent working on it in order to preserve one book. That amount of self-sacrifice was incredible. That is the story of the Ramal. And we went into his synagogue and we told that story. In Krakow, there was a man by the name of Oskar Schindler, who I'm sure you've all heard of, I'm sure you've all seen the movie put out by Steven Spielberg. And we visited the factory, the enamel factory, where he saved the lives of 600 Jews. Incredible. After the war, he was a pauper. He lived like a rich man. After the war, he was a pauper. And some of the Jews who he saved tried to help him out after the war. But we were told that from those 600 Jews, <coughs> that he saved. Today, if you count their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren, there are enough people, direct descendants of those 600, to fill a football stadium. A football stadium. How many people does a football stadium hold? I did a little research anywhere from 80,000 to 120,000. I believe at U of M in Ann Arbor, their football stadium holds 120,000 people. Okay? Enough people to fill 80,000 people. He was responsible for saving 80,000 people. There is a Talmudic expression that says that anyone who saves one life is as if they have saved an entire world. And I believe that they gave that. The Jews that were saved by Schindler as a parting gift inscribed this in metal, and they gave it to him as a gift. And I was thinking, 600 people are enough to fill a football stadium. Six million people were murdered. How many football stadiums is that? Do a little bit of math. 10,000 
10,000 10, football stadiums the Nazis were responsible for killing. How many people is that? 800 million. And if it's the size of the U of M, it's over a billion. They didn't just kill 6 million Jews. They killed a lot more than that. Going back to the Torah portions that we're reading these weeks, going back to the story of Cain and Abel, the first murder in history. Cain and Abel were the two sons of Adam and Eve, and Cain was a farmer, Abel was a shepherd with a flock, and each of them one day bring an offering to God. Cain doesn't bring the highest quality produce he has, he brings the inferior stuff. Abel presents a very nice offering to God. And God kind of accepts Abel's and rejects Cain's. And Cain is jealous of his brother. He starts an altercation, he begins a fight, he says he spoke to him, and it was words of discord, of fighting. And then Cain kills his brother. He kills Abel. And God comes to him and says, where is Abel your brother? And he says the famous biblical words, am I my brother's keeper? And God says to him, what you've done is absolutely horrific. He says, the bloods, in the plural, the bloods of your brother are crying out to me from the ground. And the commentators ask, why is he using the plural word bloods? It just say the blood in the singular. And Rashi gives an answer. He says, you know why? Because it's not just the blood of Abel that you spill, but Abel was destined to have children. He was going to have descendants. And they would have children. And they would have children. You are responsible for the murder of all those people that you precluded from ever standing on the face of the earth. So that was my thought. Oscar Schindler, the great savior, football stadium. But that makes the Nazis even more guilty. Because how many football stadiums did they kill? Later that day we arrived in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Auschwitz is the museum park. And then Birkenau is the place where they had many, many gas chambers, which they destroyed. There are pretty much no standing gas chambers in Birkenau. It's just, it's rubble. We went to one of these gas chambers. It was number four. And uh, just a pile of rocks, pretty much. It was amazing that we had great weather throughout the trip. When we get to Birkenau, the skies go completely dark and gray, and there's thunder, and there's lightning, and we get drenched, poured on. And nobody cared, because when you're in Birkenau, you don't care about getting a little bit wet. And we, arm in arm, were singing, Am Yisrael, Chai, the Jewish people will live on, because we're here, and they're not. And we lit candles memory of the people who have been murdered. And then we're walking out, walking back towards the bus, walking towards the gate of Birkenau. I'm going to pass it around my phone later to show you the picture of what this looked like. And the rain had stopped, and the sun comes out, and the most magnificent rainbow I have ever seen in my life went right across the gate. I'm, I'm actually going to bring up this photo now. I have to ask the camera to forgive me. Take me a moment to look at this picture. I have a lot of pictures of my kids on my phone, I'm a proud Jewish father, and therefore I need to sift through a bunch of those in order to find this. But there are two pictures, and I want you to pass the phone around, and you're going to look at that picture, and you're going to scroll over to the other one. Okay. All right, so those are the two pictures. You can pass it around. I'm going to stop talking while we pass that phone around. There it is. I don't care to see it. The right. rainbow? The rainbow's fine, not the real rainbow. Well, yeah, yeah. The rainbow. <laughs> when my son went to a uh, far south of the school trip, so this, they brought all their food in from Israel. Mm -hmm. so, they yeah. find kosher food. so we had a kosher nice. caterer based out of Warsaw, and they brought their truck and catering yeah. truck with us, and they gave us our food. Mm -hmm.
was a docent. I signed up when I first opened at the Holocaust Memorial Center. Mm -hmm. And I took, and he rest in peace. Wow. There are two photos. You could scroll to either side and see. You'll find the second photo. Do you have any guess how many Jews are left in the war? Not many. Very few. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end with the following thought, which is that what is the significance of a rainbow? What's the significance of a rainbow? If you look in the Torah, in the end of the story of Noah, you find the rainbow being discussed. And God says to Noah, after the flood, after everyone had been wiped off the face of the earth, God says to Noah, I promise you, Noah, I will never do this again. I will never destroy mankind. There may be times where I want to. There may be times of harshness, difficulty, challenge. But I promise you, Noah, I will never destroy this utter and complete destruction ever again. And just to show you a symbol of this promise, the symbol of that promise, he says, is the rainbow. Look in the clouds, and the idea is that when there's clouds and darkness, clouds always means that it's blocking out the sunlight, the light, it's a dark time. But you see the rainbow, the symbol of hope, that we will never be wiped out completely. And as we're walking out of Auschwitz, the largest extermination camp of the Nazis, where they killed millions of Jews, and they tried to destroy us completely, there was the symbol that you will never be completely destroyed. There may be difficult and harsh times, but that rainbow was there saying, the Jewish people will live on. That was the symbol of our hope. I thank you for coming this morning, and I wish you all a beautiful day.